Welcome to Making Therapy Better, the podcast that brings together some of the top minds in psychotherapy as well as everyday clinicians to talk about where the field is headed and how we can achieve better mental health care for everyone. Making Therapy Better is hosted by Professor Bruce Wampole, who has dedicated his career to understanding how therapy works and advocating evidence-based methods for improving outcomes. His guest today is Robbie Babbins-Wagner, Ph.D., Robbie is CEO of the Calgary Counseling Center, widely recognized as a leading institution in accessible, evidence-based community mental health care. She is also an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Calgary and serves on the Board of Directors for PolicyWise. She has conducted leading research on mental health, counseling outcomes, social finance, and social innovation, and has received several awards, including the University of Calgary Alumni Achievement Award and the 2017 Grant McEwen Lifetime Achievement Award. Making Therapy Better is brought to you by CarePaths. CarePaths has been helping in-person and virtual therapy practices thrive for over 20 years with their complete web-based EHR and practice management platform. As mental health care evolves, CarePaths is leading the way in making measurement-based care easy and cost-effective for therapists. Visit carepaths.com to sign up for a free trial today. And now, without further ado, Episode 6 of Making Therapy Better, Tracking Outcomes in Community Mental Health with Robbie Babbins-Wagner, Ph.D. Well, welcome, Robbie. Um, I'm eager to talk to you today. I did want to tell my audience that um, I've worked with you and consulted with the Calgary Counseling Center. So we have worked um, on this project. And so uh, just so that's on everybody's mind. So, uh, Robbie, why don't we start by describing the Calgary Counseling Center? Um, what clients it serves, but importantly, your efforts to uh, improve therapy outcomes there. Okay. Calgary um, Counseling Center is actually celebrating its 60th anniversary this year. We opened up as a small organization in 1962, and for the sake of the viewers, we are both a charity and a nonprofit. Um, so our goal is to um, um, help people in need and specifically provide counseling services to do that. In addition to counseling, we train counselors. We're probably the largest trainer in our region outside of health services. We do counseling research and we do uh, policy advocacy. So changing ways work is done, change, changing the ways people think about counseling and our work. So it's uh, we're very focused, but we all what we all what we do is also comprehensive. I joined the center thirty years ago. I think I was the number the third or fourth person there. No, fourth or fifth person there, and we're we've now grown to the point where including all of our students were, I think last year we were about 130 people, about 65 staff and the rest of the folks are students and um, volunteers. So uh, we're, it's uh, quite a, a, quite a happening place. Um, the outcome, well, you're, you're the biggest provider in yeah. Alberta, is that right? Yeah, we're the biggest yeah. provider. Um, there may be one agency in Edmonton, uh, that's bigger than us, because, but their work is more comprehensive and broader than just counseling, mm. and, um, way broader than just counseling. But uh, in terms of counseling services, we're probably the biggest provider. And in last June, we were offered actually a contract from our provincial government to expand our services uh, provincially through remote services, through virtual mm. services. Yeah. So that was quite um that we were thrilled to get that um that contract and to see the relationship that we've developed with them uh continue to grow. Um we see from a client perspective, we see everybody who walks in. About mm -hmm. 60% of our clients um need financial support to uh receive their services. And last year, our, the total amount that we subsidized services was about $2.1 million. And mm. our fundraising team spends time um, looking for grants and opportunities to replace those funds. And 40% um, of our clients actually 
um, um, pay fees or contribute fees that are higher than our unit cost with about um, 5% playing, paying full market. And in market, mm-hmm. it is about $200 an hour. Mm-hmm. So it's a really, it's a challenge sometimes to manage kind of um, uh, uh, those most in need and those most vulnerable and those needing care. And at the same time, working with people that might be business people, senior executives. So the mix is uh, really important to us, though. And we want to make sure that no matter who you are, no matter what you earn, no matter what you do, you're treated exactly the same way as everybody else. Um, so, so Robbie, let me stop here just for a minute because um, the people I've interviewed have been researchers and clinicians. So they're at the direct service level, either from studying it or from performing services or both. Yeah. You're a manager of care, and so many managers um, are, you know, what you described is a full-time job just managing the finances, the service provision, the infrastructure. And most managers are focused on doing that in an efficient way, um, reducing the wait list, increasing throughput, uh, managing risks, um, trying to say we provide evidence-based services. But that hasn't been enough for you guys. So say, <laughs> say uh, uh, the part about, uh, or let's talk about the part yeah. about improving uh, services as well as just managing services. Yeah. Well, I'll talk about. I, I until COVID started in March 2020. Here, I was still seeing clients because we have a belief that you have to do to understand. Mm. And as soon as kind of my life, I'm still busy with COVID related things. And um, even though we've uh, not had a lockdown in about a year there, it's still the effect of the pandemic is still pretty great in our community. And so as soon as that happens, I'll probably pick up a couple of clients. But um, it's really important to me that people um, know how to do the work, get appropriate supervision, get appropriate mentoring and um, also balance their life and their workload. And from a historical perspective, I'm a social worker by training. And um, I became, I was one of those students who did everything possible not to take research and counseling when I did my first two undergraduate degrees and then my master's. And when I was working at one of my first jobs in Calgary, I found out that I actually needed the research because I was being asked questions and didn't quite know how to do that component of the work. And I was still a clinician and just a department manager then. And because I teach in the faculty of social work at the University of Calgary, they actually, a couple of people, I went in and said, who can I talk to and what courses can I audit? And there was one individual in particular who uh, mentored me and really helped me focus on what I needed teach me the skills that I needed to do, let me take the courses that I uh, she thought I needed to take, and really brought me to the point where when I read um, the book, The Heroic Client, mm. in about 2020, um, it spoke to me and my heart as a clinician and said, okay, I've got to learn more about this. And and that's where my story, I'll talk about that in a minute, about kind of the outcome story. But um, so it's as we've grown at the center, my team has grown. So I'm the CEO, the, um, the team of people that reports to me has grown considerably. And every one of them, the five people on that team are very talented in their own rights. And so I have somebody who does the fundraising and she calls me in when when she needs to. I don't do all the fundraising anymore. And when um, our director of counseling is responsible now for all the um, the, the direct outcome work. And I see my job as really to um, steer the ship and keep us focused strategically on what we want to accomplish and get my hands dirty from every time to t- every mm-hmm. every once in a while. 
by either doing some clinical work, doing clinical supervision, and being called in to consult on uh, very challenging cases. So I still do the work that I love, but I don't think anything has captured my interest and attention like the outcome piece. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because I think it has been such a game changer for me and for our organization. Yeah, let's let's focus on that for a few minutes. You say the the outcome piece, but exactly what does that involve? Well, one of my as I read the book, it was interesting because I didn't find the book myself. A colleague of mine found it and she said, I just read this book. She was a British woman, woman, kind of short, a little older than me. And she said, I I had supervised her during her master's practicum. And she came to me one day and she said, I've just read this book and I hear your voice in my head as I was reading this. And I said, can I borrow it? Because this was the day before Amazon. I would have had to wait five or six weeks for the publisher to ship it to me. And I read it over the weekend. I couldn't put it down. And I said, this book is speaking to all my frustrations about the work. Clients not showing. Us never really knowing how we're doing with a client. Um, having a system that we could put in to really support what we what we were doing. And actually having our counselors feel better about what they're doing. So we took a very slow journey from that point. That was 2000. In 2002, there was a kind of the heart and soul of change conference in Toronto. I think you were there because I just Mm -hmm. found some notes where I have notes of your talk there. And uh, I was cleaning up a couple of weeks ago and found them. And um, I came home from that higher than a kite Mm -hmm. because every speaker brought a different aspect to the thinking about this work. And um, in speaking to a colleague the day after uh, I got back, this is an academic colleague, he said to me, Robbie, you're gonna do all the work anyways, why don't you piggyback your PhD on this? Which is what I did. Mm. So I was kind of, um, at, at some part of this journey, I think I started that in 2006, finished in 2011, did a quantitative PhD. So the gal who never wanted to do research yeah. did a quant PhD. And, um, and it was, and it was for me, it wasn't for, I wasn't going to get a new job. I didn't want to do full-time research or be a full-time academic. I'm a part-time academic. And it was amazing. So after heart and soul of change, I came, we came back and said, there were two others of us there from our agency. And we said, what can we do next? So we brought in uh, Scott Miller to, um, meet with us and train the staff. And uh, what, and we decided in 2000 and uh, in two, between 2002 and 2004 to do a pilot project. And as part of that pilot project, we tested the OQ for a whole year and we tested the um, ORS for a whole year. And at the end of that, being very Canadian, we okay. gave the staff a vote. Now I wouldn't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> if I was doing this today, but I'm glad what they chose and they chose to um, implement the OQ. And the, the outcome, Mike Lambert's outcome questionnaire. Yeah. And what one of the reasons why they chose that, and I think this stands to this day, if it was, if a client wasn't doing well, you could actually see the item level detail of mm-hmm. where you needed to focus or where you might want to consider focusing. So um, we went live. Outside of our pilot, we started collecting data using Excel spreadsheets mm-hmm. in uh, two, September 2004. And about a year and a half later, we did a first analysis of the data, just looking at simple change between the first session and the last session. What we discovered is that only 40% of the clients had been offered the OQ. Mm-hmm. And um, that threw me into a big crisis. Like, what are we going to do about this? Everybody said they wanted it. They were willing to do it and give it a good try. And um, so I ended up. So, uh, Robbie, just to interject, were you doing it with paper and pencil yeah. at that time? Yeah. 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 We're yeah. using paper and pencil. And the clients loved it from day one. We've had no pushback from clients. I don't even think 1% of our clients have declined to use it. Um, but the counselors didn't like it and didn't want to do it. So I had some really big decisions to make and probably had to make one of the toughest decisions in my career, number first one, which was to say this was mandatory. Mm-hmm. And as of September of uh, 28, it was mandatory, it was not negotiable. 
any student coming in has to know that in advance. All the staff have to know, mm-hmm. have, staff have to agree with that. And lo and behold, by December of that year, 40% of the staff had left. Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget the day that the director of counseling, who's the same person that's director of counseling today, walked into my office and she said, how do you know this is the right thing? (laughs) And I said, on the one hand, I don't. But on Mm -hmm. the other hand, everything in my soul tells me we're on track and we just have to get the right people in who are interested in doing this work. Mm -hmm. which is what we did. We recruited, we filled all those positions. We were much smaller in those days, so it wasn't quite as challenging as it is today. We filled all those positions and and things started to change. And the other thing that we did, and we did this kind of in those days as, um, um, as a gift to the staff, we invited Scott to come in and do monthly consultations with us at that Mm -hmm. time. And, um, and the focus of those consultations, that continues to this day. We don't do as many of them. Um, really, the focus of those consultations is it's really he's consulting to us on cases that aren't progressing. And Because when we started doing it, the only cases that people brought were cases that were doing really well. And the, we to, brought to the staff meetings. Brought and, to the consulting sessions. Yeah. And, and we were doing it on, I don't even know the software tool. I think we were using Skype in those days. That was before most of us had technology on our desktops to be able to do this. So we were doing it during, we were using Skype. The sessions were clunky sometimes. But when what we learned was when the people who were really struggling with their cases if they actually took the feedback from the consultation and tried it, it usually had a positive impact on their client. Mm. And they started to spread the word to their peers that this was helping. So and, Robbie, I, I wanna, sorry if I interrupt occasionally, but okay. some of the points you're making are so important. I want uh, just to reemphasize them. You know, I've been to staff meetings uh, um, for 40 years or more at different locations internationally. And almost always, somebody brings a case that shows what a great therapist they are. And so you're um, uh, early on emphasis on let's bring the cases that are not on track or failing uh, because those are the ones where we need to pay attention. And I think right. that's worth emphasizing. It's a really important change that made your work different. Absolutely. And we, you know, we called this, we wanted to be error centric because we don't learn from things that are going well. We only learn from things that aren't going well. And people truly had to trust, and this is a really important piece, that we weren't going to use the information, people's outcomes, the counselor's outcomes as part of performance management. Mm-hmm. And that they could never, it could never be part of a discussion about performance management or used for yearly compensation changes or anything like that. And um, the reason for that is we had to separate the two because one was a clinical process and one was an agency administrative process. And the more we did that as people, and more, the more people saw that we were going to be true to that idea, the more I think anxiety settled down. Mm. And people started to trust us around that piece. And, and my attitude then and is still today, if you're not doing well, that's great news. We can yeah. help you get better yeah. if you want to do yeah. that. If you don't want to do that, we're probably not the place you should be working. But if mm. you do want to get better at what you do, I know we can help you do that. And we've done that, mm. some people. Mm. Um, so I think the the um, doing the consultations were part of the culture change internally and us being responsive to them because at some point, probably in that early time, one of the counselors said, how do we know how we're doing? I get the individual reports, but what does this look like on what we would call an aggregate level? Mm-hmm. We only started pulling reports for people as they started asking for it. And we bring that to a staff meeting and say, there have been some requests to get, um, uh, um, we do these in trimesters in four month four month increments. 
Um, and there's been a request to see all your data pulled together in one place. And we came up with our idea of what that should look like. We brought it to them. They added feedback to the form and we changed it and we tested it and massaged it. And to the point now where we haven't changed it in quite a while, I think it's due for a new look at some point either this yeah. year. And so, so to be clear, Robbie, sorry, interrupting again, but the reports you're talking about are aggregate reports of the outcomes of the individual therapist. Yeah. So this is information about how they're doing uh, on an aggregate basis. And I think this is another one of the principles that's really important. You involved the staff uh, in designing how that would be done. So they didn't feel like this was a mandate from you or the administration to do this, but this right. was something they asked for and delivered in a way that they thought was useful. Yeah, and, and oftentimes when we had data that didn't make sense to us, we actually shared the blind data. It was blind to the counselor. It was, didn't mm -hmm. have identifiers of the counselors. And we would show that at a staff meeting and say, help us make sense of this. So mm -hmm. that we didn't want to embarrass anybody. We, we didn't want to put somebody on the spot, but it was a great way again to engage um, the staff and the team in this journey. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was really, and continues to be to this day, super important to us. Um, so things were going um, really well. Over time, we ended up developing our own software for this because given our size and given the fact that we're a charity and small, um, buying into most of the other, the software tools that were available were too expensive for us. Mm -hmm. And we don't use it ourselves. We don't share this with anybody. And um, um and we started using it for other purposes. We tested rep uh, reporting to our funders this way. And mm -hmm. we had a major flood in Calgary um, in 2008. And I got, some, again, a grant from the province to open up a satellite in the area that was more Im most impacted, which was about 40 minutes south of Calgary and High River. And my, when I got the reports from the funder about what they wanted, Every quarter, I couldn't do the reports because they had no meaning. So I redeveloped the form and included the outcomes. And I could report down to the detail how many new clients had started, how many only had one session, how many clients uh, finished, what was the average, you know, the range of sessions uh, with or without one session, and then what their first session score was our last session score was the change score. And then mm -hmm. the categories of change, how many percentage, because the outcome tool, you can look at the percentage of uh, clients that reach statistical significance um, in, and recover and improve on the questionnaire. And, um, and we started reporting that and um, to the funder. And it's the first time they ever received any mm -hmm. hard data that could measure or describe what we were doing and the impact that we were having for the people that we were seeing. Again, quite unusual because uh, most agency reports are around uh, service utilization. How many uh, clients did we see? Um, not their outcomes. So uh, I think it's worth noting another innovation that the reports on your activities emphasize the outcomes. How many of these patients are we actually helping? Exactly. I think I think that has become so critical to us and, and understanding our work. And when we were given the funding um, for the provincial project, that has become a key component. Government actually wanted that in there, mm. which is the first time that I've seen that. Yeah. So they've changed too. Yeah. They've seen that. Yeah. Well. This is really important information. Yeah, and and I think describing our impact and describing being able to quantify that and also then, you know, look at um, what are the potential, like for some of my donors want to know what's the return on investment of that. Mm. So, you know, we've also developed, uh, and we didn't develop it, but we've learned how to do social return on investment reports for um, certain funders because um, it makes a difference to the way 
uh, we think, but I think we have a job here also, and that's connected to the policy work that I'm yeah. interested in, yeah. is helping funders change the way they do it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, Robbie, you had mentioned that um, uh, if you had an underperforming therapist, in a sense, that was was uh, something to work on. As a focus, we can help that therapist improve. Yeah. As well as all other therapists. Say more about how you would actually do that. We would. Um, it, it usually was their supervisor, but I'd coach their supervisor. I or the director of counseling would coach their supervisor on how to do some of this work and how to help the um, counselor focus on goals and mm -hmm. not have a counseling session. The one I look to edit from behind a mirror, I'm going, what the heck is the focus here? Or mm -hmm. they've used three different models of therapy in the last 20 minutes. So there was little coherence in what I was seeing happen and that the supervisor had to help them kind of slow down, get more confidence in they were, what they were doing, try and pick a framework. I don't care what framework. As an organization, we're agnostic to model, but everybody has to have a model that they, or models that they are most personally affiliated with. Um, just to be able to be articulate about what they're doing. And um, so we did that and worked slowly with people, focused on alliance. As you know, I, re I remember one session in particular of a very difficult client where the counselor was actually terrified of this individual. Mm. And no matter what we did or asking him to do, he couldn't engage. And we were like an hour and a half into the session and I called him out behind the mirror and I said, you need to do one thing in the next 20 minutes. I said, because if I go in to that session, you're to try and rescue you, uh, you're gonna lose credibility with this guy. That was my assessment of it from uh, having worked with many guys like that over the years. And I said to him, all you have to do is find something likable about him. Get to know him a little bit, irrespective of why he's here or why he was referred here. I want you to connect with him as a human, not as a client. And he went in and did an adequate job with that. And then between that one and the next, the next session, because the fellow actually came back <laughs> for another session, I wasn't so sure that was going to happen. Um, we coached him some more, but I realized he could not do what this client needed um, therapeutically, and we transferred him to somebody who could. Hmm. So, um, so what but, I take take away from from this is that uh, for a particular therapist who outcomes may need improvement, particularly, it's really a focus on what's happening in the session. It isn't a focus on the therapist and their own problems or counter-transference. You want to look at the tapes and supervise around the tapes to help that therapist do something differently and better. Yeah. And after that session, I had him go back and review the recording and look at what he noticed was different between the early part of the session and that and come back and talk to us about that. And uh, he started to see it, but he could also acknowledge, I can't work with somebody like mm -hmm. this. This was mm -hmm. an offender and there was some pretty horrible things that this person did. And, and I respect that. And that he said, finally said that instead of going in and trying to do something that he wasn't capable of doing. He ended up not choosing counseling as his career Mm -hmm. uh, which was probably um, a good thing. Um, but I think we helped him do that. I think had he not been supported in the way that we did, he could have ended up being in a place that wouldn't have been a good fit for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So um, what we described sounds a lot like deliberate practice. Mm -hmm. So talk about kind of the the center's uh, uh, efforts in deliberate practice. And again, I want to mention that, that I've been consulting with you about how we might do this. 
I think it was called, I think we were doing it before it was called that. And I really attributed some of the initial focus on that, on the training that I received, because I had really some amazing supervisors in my time who didn't allow me to get away with stuff like kind of going in multiple directions, sticking to a path, getting focused, focusing on alliance, making sure that was intact and working uh, for myself and the client when I was doing that. And it was really about um, understanding what each unique client needs, may need, Mm -hmm. trying to pair a clinician with that client accordingly. And we do that usually from the intake. And then um, um, observing the the sessions when they're not going, well, we do observe sessions that are going well too, but observing sessions that are not going well to really figure out on how to get it back on track and being super focused in what we're doing when we do that. Mm -hmm. So um, you're not going to generally see me work with more than one um, uh, model at any point in time. Um, I may kind of expand it later on as the goals change, but not early on. I really want to make sure that what that we're working with is actually a goal and not a means. Um, so that we're focused on something the client has the potential to change and will bring uh, focus or meaning or change something in their life that they can see. Because it doesn't matter if I can see it. Mm-hmm. They need to be the one that sees it and experience it and knows what to do next. And if they don't know, we can help them with some of that too. So I think that was really important. And I think the consultations... Uh, with Scott have kind of brought also that in um, sub, um, subliminally because he doesn't always call it deliberate practice and what he's doing, but I can hear it and see it when he's doing it. So I think there have been a combination of influences on our work around that. But I think I think our mantra as a team is that we're looking to pair the client with a therapist that fits for them and has the skills to meet their needs. And we ask questions. So we don't do an intake like many folks do in the States. It's not a separate session. The counselor is assigned to the client at session one. We do not do it. You got you folks would do traditionally as an intake and we're into it right away. And, um, but we ask more questions on the intake that they fill out in order to try and figure out those elements. So we ask about preferences. Because if they have a preference for male or female, that may make a difference to them. Mm -hmm. If they have a preference, we've actually had clients ask for preferences of hair color of their client or wearing glasses or other things. We always try to meet those preferences. We're also open six days a week so we can meet somebody's needs who can't miss work or is involved with childcare and doesn't want to bring their child. So we're open Saturdays as well till three. Um, and um, working early on to hone the, the focus and the goal is number one. And number two, um, making sure, checking the scores at every session before, before they start with the client, having the conversation with the client about the graph, because produ- our system produces a graph immediately, and talking about change and what may be preventing it. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a combination of all of those together that's making a difference. I'm a strong believer. So as much as I love the outcome piece, I've always loved to train by doing. And I don't mean by showing, it's usually by role play. Mm-hmm. So if I'm working with a clinician who's really struggling, I said, well, why don't you be the therapist and I'll be the client? And let's try that. And we often then break it into small pieces to talk about what worked and what didn't work. And then again, we might record those to review that after so they can go over that recording again and again if they need to, to see what the differences were between a segment that didn't work or a segment that did work. Mm -hmm. So you have the components of deliberate practice in many ways. So you're identifying uh, a skill or a response that needs to be different, role-playing it, recording it, having a chance to to do that over again. Robbie, you've mentioned 
several times, and I think it's it's worth noting that one of the areas in which you as a supervisor, but other supervisors as well, is around the focus of the session, that it needs to be cogent, consistent, focused on the patient's problems and the goals that they wish to achieve. And often the sessions can be, or or sometimes can be, disjointed. As you said, they might have tried two or three different uh, modalities. And it's interesting because in my supervision of beginning therapists, that's that's been a uh, uh, an issue too. It's the, the sessions just don't seem to have a theme. They're not focused on on something on which the client can work. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think they get, and I say this with all due respect to my academic colleagues who may be watching this. Um, At university, they're usually trained in a single model or sometimes multiple models. Like we have a course in our faculty that, you know, you do a model a week for 13 weeks. And when I teach it, I don't teach it that way. So I have students present a a different model every week for 13 weeks, brief presentation. And then we go on talk about the core skills that you need across all the models that are similar, because that's the piece that I think is going to allow a student to become a successful clinician. Mm -hmm. So students are confused, but they also believe what their teachers tell them. And they feel that they're kind of violating principles um, if they don't do some of that, if they if they don't practice CBT or EFT or some of the other models mm-hmm. that are there. And I've said, you've got to focus on what is going on in the room and what's going to best help this individual, mm-hmm. um, uh, help this individual work. And, um, and I think that's been super important because one of the, re- one, I think with the other issue with teaching models only is students don't have the fluency in models and the experience to be able to shift gears if they need to, then more experienced clinicians do or clinician researchers and instructors do Mm -hmm. or may have. So I think we um, we're sometimes expecting something from students that they don't have the skills or ability to do so at that stage of their learning. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I have this right. So you're really saying that there needs to be a consistent model or at least an approach that uh, uh, kind of underlies what's going on. But that needs to be delivered in a flexible and skillful way. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying because the model itself gives you some ideas of what you could do and how, but it may not work for a lot of Mm -hmm. clients you see. So what do you do then if you've only learned one model? Yeah. <laughs> or have That's always our problem. Model. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I've seen that a lot, in our, especially in our students, because most of them um, come out of program, university programs that are that only teach one model. Mm-hmm. Robbie, let's shift gears for a bit, because um, as a manager of an agency, you had to face the pandemic and changed dramatically, almost overnight, the way you provided services. I mean, you went from probably a nearly 100% in-person to nearly 100% um, video mediated. So talk about that experience. It's really interesting to, to delve into this because, I mean, this is a crisis. Uh, I mean, the pandemic is a crisis, but it's a crisis or a challenge for agencies to adapt almost instantaneously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, I've had a lot of experience in in crisis training, having worked in health before I came to the community. And my favorite, one of my favorite things to do is to be on the emergency crisis team. And in my training in my early years, I also worked in emergency rooms. Um, So I was there through real life crises for a lot Mm. of people. So I think that has helped me learn to be really calm, (laughs) really focused, be clear on my messaging, and not to get swept up into 
kind of crisis mode. I do that at home. <laughs> I have people here to, that I can kind of um, um, talk to at the end of the day and my team. I do that too. But um, so I had to figure out. So let's just for some background, we had been testing. We had two or three counselors who were really interested in the idea of online work. And they had been testing with clients that were interested um, on virtual counseling uh, using Skype. So when the pandemic came, they had been sharing their learnings and what they were doing, and they had, we had some mm-hmm. protocols in place. Um, and we had been uh, working within, we were a Microsoft shop, first of all, and, um, and we had teams installed just before this, but not the full suite, just the pieces that we needed to use. So when the when we were told on a Friday that there, we were going to be shut down by Monday, um, then we actually had the weekend. Our tech team worked all weekend to get everybody set up with Microsoft mm. Teams for video work. And everybody got a crash course on Monday morning and how to do this and how to work with it. And because there were people that had done this before, they also helped deal with people's anxiety. But let's Mm -hmm. add to this, there was a whole other level of this because people were also worried about their well-being. Everybody had individual anxiety about Mm -hmm. this. They weren't sure how this was going to work. I have a lot of staff who are parents of young kids so how are they going to be able be deal with working at home, um, looking after their kids, and then kids homeschooling who might need their help and structure around that? Yeah. So there was a layer of that also that influenced our work. And um, probably thankfully, in the first couple of weeks, we would get phone calls from clients telling us they want to wait till this is over. So they'll cancel their sessions for two or three weeks. Mm. And and they book an appointment and then say, well, I guess this isn't ending so fast. I think we should just be able to do this. As is typical for us, and this may be significant in our community. I don't know if other people experience this. Um, initially, referrals slow down. So with a, um, um, a lower volume of clients coming in, and we see about 10 to 11,000 new clients a year just to give a sense of the size. Um, so with the with new referrals slowing down and then with people canceling appointments, we had a lot of breathing room in order mm-hmm. to actually go over this again with people, start to think about how we're going to develop protocols for the use, let people try it. How do we deal with safety? We do a lot of domestic violence work. Mm-hmm. How do we know that a woman or a man is safe to talk to us on the phone? Yeah. Um, in their session, how do what how how do we deal with um, uh, concerns about suicide? Um, can our system plug into nine one one like it can now to manage a call or to get police or EMS not to the center anymore to their home? Where do mm-hmm. we find those addresses? Because the files were in the office and people were working from home. So we had, those were a lot of, those were more greater challenges, like the logistics of not having your paper with you um, was a, probably a bigger challenge than how to use the system at that point. Because mm. uh, we started having meetings immediately on Teams. So people got used to being a receiver. And then we also created what we called scrums. And this comes from the IT world. They call them standups but they get together for a certain amount of time every single morning just to connect, talk about what's going to happen that day. We created scrums on teams where we had our different groups of people together and we answered questions. Our tech people were on the calls and we were there just to provide support and guidance for people. Somebody would be, could be in the room with the counselor while they were trying to log on or teach a client over time, over the next weeks, we had written protocols for all these pieces we found a way to keep all of our notes virtually, like uh, within Teams, so that people didn't have to get their files. And to the point now where we are completely paperless um, and we have e-files for everything. Again, we developed them. We didn't use somebody else's software. And 
because rules for files in Canada and maintenance of files and sharing information are very different than they are in other country. They're probably more similar to the, what the EU and the UK have done than to the US. And uh, so we have to teach our people those skills while, while also helping them not burn out. Mm -hmm. And I remember at one meeting where, um, oh, the other part is Kathy and I would, our director of counseling and I would attend many of these meetings. And we would, if she was leading, I'd be watching the staff and what was going on. And if we were concerned about somebody, we'd follow up right after the session. So you could do you could do that uh, uh, again. It's always difficult on on virtual to monitor people's reactions. So you worked as a a team to do that, but you were able to actually through the little uh, boxes of people be able to see who was distressed and and found the situation challenging. Yeah. And like, you know, Joe Smith used to be really communicative, very engaged, and he's super quiet. So yeah. one of us would follow up and we had stopped yeah. doing that after about five, six months. And at one point, the director of counseling, we were in a big staff meeting online and she had to say to the counselors, you know, we're not responsible for the mental health of everybody in this province and in this community. Uh, none of our shoulders, and even as organization, our shoulders are not that broad. Um, the only people you need to be worried about are the needs of yourselves and your families and those clients that have been assigned to you. Uh, because there are other agencies in town that are doing this work. Government mm -hmm. has a responsibility here during this time of the pandemic. And uh, people's needs will get met. Um, because they were, and we're still trying to get people to slow down. Yeah. Now, some of yeah. that's going slowly has been, it was probably a problem before COVID, but was less visible. Mm -hmm. It became way more visible um, after COVID and when, um, um, and the conference, some of the conversations in our meeting changed. So we've only now, just about at the three year mark, uh, started thinning out our meetings and, um, refocusing the goals of some of them, but that's one of those scrums we maintain to this day because it mm. also has provided another vehicle to communicate with people. Yeah. So clearly it's it's a personal uh, uh, challenge because you're dealing with uh, therapists and the clients who are experiencing a new way yeah. of getting help. There's the technological challenge of uh, getting this up and running, uh, not just the face-to-face, -face, but the uh, the notes, uh, um, all the record keeping, and so forth. So an immense challenge. And clearly, it's been successful. Um, you know, we just had a paper accepted this week, Robbie, as you know, that shows that the outcomes of the virtual video mediated therapy is as effective and even maybe slightly more effective than the in-person, which to many of us is a surprise. You know, I didn't know what those outcomes were gonna be either. I had no clue. Um, and a lot of us, our staff, some of our staff were surprised why it's some weren't because they said a lot of them think for their very vulnerable clients that the screen provides some safety for clients. Mm. For other groups of vulnerable clients, clients who are more financially challenged, they don't have to travel to the center in whatever yeah. way they do. They don't have to um, find childcare. They can be in a two-hour group with their kids in the next room, unless their kids are super little. Mm. So it's provided, they love it to the point that we started um, offering um, in-person services about two or three months ago, and we've had very little uptake on them. Less than 1% of the clients coming in want in-person service. Now, do I think that will change? Probably, but who knows? Yeah, it's, it's, the other unknowns, right? Yeah, it's really... Um, Again, quite uh, uh, amazing that this major innovation created by a terrible event, the pandemic, 
really has changed how we're doing services. As you say, um, the clients, by and large, really find this preferable in many ways. Yes. And, um, you know, that's another study we could do at some point to find out what it is, like in more detail, what they like about it. But, um, yeah, I was surprised, too. Like, it became a necessity um, uh, early in the pandemic. And now that it's no longer a necessity, people are still um, choosing to do it. And for us in Alberta, you know, we're a very large project in uh, a a province in land. Mm-hmm. It's a very big Canada. If you haven't been to Canada, it's a super <laughs> huge. Um, it's a super huge cu- country, and it takes a long time because of the size of the country to get between major cities. You know, Vancouver's an hour flight from here, but it'll take us twelve hours to drive there, as an example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and people are and spread out in rural areas. I mean, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. we have people in the very far north, and I think virtual care for them is a lifeline and in an imperative because you can't get clinicians to live up there yeah. for the most part. Yeah. So I think it also allows us to provide a much needed service to people who haven't historically been able to have access to it. So here's the surprising part, though, Robbie. Um, initially. Therapists told me that this is this is more stressful, more demanding, uh, uh, leading to more burnout uh, than being face to face. So the your therapist with whom I'm working on the supervision project, I asked him about this a few weeks ago, and their reaction was not that at all. They said, if we have to go back in 100% of the time. I'm not going to continue employment. Yeah. I want to continue the virtual uh, uh, at-home uh, delivery of services. So what's your take on this? Were you surprised about that as well or, or not? No, but it comes out in different ways. Um, so I think they like being home and the lack of stress that comes from being home. And even I like the fact that on the days that I'm home, the, I like the fact that I don't have to get up and rush to go into the office. I can take my time in the morning. Um, but what they are missing is the connection with their colleagues. So we're still, uh, we're in the office one day a week now. We're going to go up to two days a week sometime mm-hmm. soon. I don't, we don't know. We've had huge viral loads here of three different, uh, three different viruses, COVID being one of them up until recently. So we're waiting to see if there's an eighth wave or if we're, if it's going to stay low, at which point we'll go up to two days a week. And the other conversation we've had with everybody, and we have some people that are in full time because uh, mm-hmm. they find it easier to work and be structured from the office. Um what um, what we've said to people is we're okay with them being in the office two days, three days, five days, whatever, for now. Um, we have no plan to make it more than that. But if a client request for in-person services increases, that has to be, that responsibility has to be assumed by everybody equitably. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure we may get to that point at some point, but we don't know yet because we're not giving all the in-person cases to the three or four or five people who are in all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Robbie, we're, we're um, going to be up the hour soon. Um, I know we could go on for a few more hours about this, but it's been fascinating um, to listen to the evolution of using outcome measures uh, to guide um, the delivery of services. And particularly important is the way you have implemented this. Involve the therapist uh, in the process. Um, separate the clinical use from the administrative use. And the, really the incorporation of those measures to improve the quality of services. You know, Robbie, I asked you one time, I don't know if you remember this, I asked you, uh, well, don't you have some therapists who are 
resistant to doing this? And your answer was, well, not anymore, because um, they left. And it's important to recognize that for those therapists, um, this wasn't the right environment. Um, but what you were left with are therapists who were dedicated to using this yeah. in a way that really leads to improved services. So uh, uh, the, I think the lessons for implementation are really important. And I agree. And, and we get students sometimes who think they want to do it and then decide kind of four months in. They're usually with us for eight months. They sometimes Some of them decide a small number that this isn't for them. And we work with their university to transition them to another practical placement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's rare, but it does happen. Yeah. It's um it's super interesting when um and some people turn around after a period of time, usually again related to a success uh, mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's um I think there's a lot more learning to happen for us and for others. But um this to me, our implementation was really grounded in our values as an organization. And probably for us on the leadership team about how we would want to have been treated had we been in the same shoes as our clinicians, because we didn't have to do this. Like yeah. we started doing this before anybody wanted any data from us. But we really believe that we had a responsibility to ensure that clients, that we do our best to help clients benefit from the care they were receiving. Well, it's it's... I mean, I was just at a conference in Norway on measurement-based care. And there are um, agencies and therapists who are, are still resistant to these kinds of measurements. And the point was made, well, if we don't know how we're doing, how will we ever have a chance to get better at this? Yeah. And so it, it's... it's it's almost a, an ethical imperative that if you're going to deliver services, you need to know what the quality of those services are. Yeah. I agree. And I think the other thing that's really imperative is make sure you have the right supervisor in place because we were once um, involved in an implementation at an organization in our city. And um, the staff were super keen and super engaged and the manager or the supervisor responsible for those two teams um, was scared to death of this and the project mm. ended. Yeah. So again, the, having the right people and making sure and switching people around if you need to, yeah. that doesn't mean they have to go. It just means they're the ones that maybe aren't the best people to be the champion for this mm. on the team um, uh, will make a difference. Mm. Well, Robert, I should mention, you know, you're you're really have taken on three roles here. We talk about scientist practitioner. Do you do research and do you practice? Uh, you, you're kind of the the tripart one because you're a manager, uh, the director, also seeing clients and doing some of the research. And I think the staff really sees that as important. And as you described, it's really important for your perspective because you want to have the, the sense of what it's like to be doing therapy under these conditions. Yeah. So. And, and I also have lots of energy. I know a lot of people couldn't do what I do, but I have a ton yeah. of energy. And I'm seeing the positive impact on this, which I think keeps me going. I think that's why I'm still working because I love what I'm doing. I love where I do it. And I see um, amazing examples of change every single day. Mm -hmm. It is re rewarding to see the research that indicates the therapists at, at the center are improving over time. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Well, I mean, this has been a pleasure. Um, uh, you know, I've worked with you so much of this I know about, but to be able to sit down and talk about it has been um, immensely informative. Thanks, so, Bruce. Pleasure for me as well. Thank you. Thanks for listening. 
Making Therapy Better is brought to you by CarePaths. CarePaths offers a complete behavioral health EHR and practice management software solution, including claims, billing, clinical notes and documents, scheduling, and teletherapy, all for one simple and affordable monthly price. CarePaths EHR is HIPAA compliant and ONC certified and can also support electronic prescribing for an additional fee. Their latest release, CarePaths Connect, includes automated measurement-based care and the ability to create a digital front door for your practice, as well as a free mobile app designed to increase patient engagement. If you're just starting your practice or are dissatisfied with your current EHR, go to carepaths.com to start your free trial today. To find out more about Bruce Wampold and his work as CarePaths Chief Clinical Officer, visit makingtherapybetter.com.